Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Holocaust Museum Houston's virtual programs. Thank you for taking time out and being here this evening. I'm Tamara Savage, Managing Director and Director of Public Programs. And it is my great pleasure to welcome David Marwell as our guest speaker for our live webcast. Before I hand over to David Bell to do the introductions, I'd like to mention a few things. We will leave time for a brief Q&A at the conclusion of the talk. To participate, please submit your questions through the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A box will be open for questions from the beginning of Dr. Marvel's talk, so feel free to submit them as they come to mind. We will do our best to get to as many of them as possible. This program is being recorded and will be available through our YouTube platform at a later date. We will be sending out this information via email to all registrants within the next two day or two. And that's from, all from me and now I'm going to turn it over to David Bell. Thank you very much Tamara and welcome to everyone. We are delighted to have you join us this evening uh, as Holocaust Museum Houston presents another terrific program uh, tonight featuring Dr. David Marwell. Let me give you a few words of introduction. I'm Dr. Marwell, and then I will turn it over to him. David Marwell, PhD, has had a distinguished career in public history. He spent nine years at the U.S. Department of Justice, where as the chief investigative, where as chief investigative research, he conducted research in support of the investigation and prosecution of Nazi war criminals in the United States. As part of this effort, he played major roles in the Klaus Barbie and Joseph Mengele investigations and helped to author the two major reports that resulted. In 1994, he took over the position of Executive Director of the JFK Assassination Records Review Board, an independent federal agency established to identify, locate, and make available to the public all the records relating to the assassination of President Kennedy. Following this service, he became the Associate Museum Director at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And in 2000, he was appointed Director and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City. And he led that important institution for 15 years before stepping down at the end of 2015. Marwell's book, Mengele, Unmasking the Angel of Death, was published by W.W. W. Norton and Company in January of this year and has received enthusiastic reviews in such publications as The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Science, Moment Magazine, and The Times Literary Supplement. It is my great pleasure to introduce a friend of Holocaust Museum Houston and a friend of mine, David Marwell. Thank you, David Bell. Thank you for that warm introduction. I'm a big fan of your museum, as you know, David, and uh, I remember um, fondly the many times that you would stop in in New York and visit me in my office and talk about this wonderful project. And I remember as well, when I first heard of the project in, I think, 1997, when I was a, on a trip in Germany that was attended by Ellen Trachtenberg, who was then one of the members of the Board of Trustees, and she spoke with such love and, um, and affection for the project. And um, so I, I, uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and, and I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. You know, the process of writing a book begins as a lonely, isolating, and solitary exercise, but it ends in a very public way with its introduction to a broad range of people. What, is, what was once so private and intimate becomes all at once public and available to anyone who wants access, even people who are miles away from this study in my home near Washington, D.C., where I labored for several years on the book. I must say that I'm very thankful that the book has reached the stage in its life cycle when it is in the hands of so many people. And I am relieved and heartened and very satisfied that so far the response has been very positive. I thought this evening I would provide a brief introduction to the book by explaining its origin, telling you something about the sources upon which it is based, 
summarizing what I found and what I found that is new and by reading perhaps a few excerpts. And then at the end, as Tamara said, uh, we'll open it up for, for questions and answers, which I often find the most rewarding part of, of these book programs. Although I had been thinking about this book for a very long time, I can date its origin rather precisely. In the fall of 2015, I decided to step down as director of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Lower Manhattan after having led that institution for 15 years. James Barron, a reporter for the New York Times, learned of my decision to step down and during an interview asked me what my future plans were. Well, I, I blurted out without much thought that I was going to write a book about Joseph Mengele. When I read the next day about my plans in the New York Times, I felt duty bound to follow through, lest the Times be accused of fake news. Mengele has emerged as an iconic symbol of the Holocaust. Indeed, he has come for many to represent not only the Holocaust itself, but also the failure of justice at the end of World War II, which saw so many Nazi criminals escape any kind of reckoning. He is also seen as the exemplar for science gone mad. When I started work on this book over four years ago, I set up a Google alert so that I would be notified each time Mengele's name was mentioned on the internet. And since then, I have received messages nearly every single day, and most days, multiple indications that Mengele's name has been invoked, sometimes as a historical figure, but just as often as a benchmark for evil. This is throughout the internet, throughout the international press. Since the COVID pandemic, those mentions of Mengele have increased significantly as issues of medical ethics have emerged and as people have sought the right metaphor to express anger, condemnation, or describe malign behavior. The more Mengele has become a symbol, the more obscure he has become as a human being, as a man. And my book attempts to strip away some of the myth that has attached itself to Mengele and has served to elevate him to an iconic role. And at the same time, I hope to replace a frightening caricature of a man with an even more unsettling picture of the human being that he was. Beginning in 1980, I served as a historian for the US Department of Justice Office of Special Investigations, where I conducted research in support of US prosecutions of Nazi war criminals living in the United States. In 1985, I was assigned to the investigation of Joseph Mengele with the goal of discovering if he, if and how he might have been used and assisted by the United States government. And finally, to find him and to bring him to justice. This investigation was soon joined by two and then three international partners with the Israelis and Germans coming on board in early 1985 and the Brazilians in the summer of 1985 after a body thought to be that of Mengele was discovered in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I originally set out to write about my experience with this investigation, but in the end, my plans changed. Instead of restricting myself solely to writing about the investigation, I expanded my effort into a biography of the man. I had discovered a rich body of newly released records and brilliant scholarship, both of which shed light on areas of Mengele's life and career that had been unknown to me, which became available only after I started writing. The book is based on records which I found in archives in Germany, Israel, the United, and the United States. I used the once top secret CIA file on Mengele, which was released and declassified in 2000, and the secret Mossad report declassified and released only in 2017. My book is based on interviews with participants and on my own recollection of events in which I participated. It is also based on Mengele's own writings, including diaries discovered after his death, and especially an autobiographical treatment, which he chose to write in the form of a novel which freed him from the bounds of literal truth and allowed him to use the literary devices that people employ in writing fiction to tell the story of his life. Now I begin the book by describing Mengele's childhood and I admit to finding no hint there of the man he was later to become. There are no stories of him, you know, torturing pets in his backyard. He had a very conventional childhood childhood 
except that he had he came from a wealthy, well-to-do family. His father uh, had was the head of a local business which manufactured farm equipment and became the chief employee, the, one of the main employers in the town of Gunsburg where he, where he grew up and became a, a really a major economic force in the town. So the family was wealthy, Mengele was well treated, um, had a series of, uh, of nannies uh, and was well loved by his parents. I described Mengele's education, advanced degrees in both medicine and anthropology. He was given an elite education. He had inspirational teaching from Nobel Prize laureates, those, some who had already received the Nobel Prize and some who would later receive it. He, public, he published in respected journals. His medical dissertation on cleft palates was cited as late as the early 1970s in a medical journal. He received and excelled in a position as an assistant at one of the leading university institutes in Frankfurt am Main. I explain how his fields of study, medicine and anthropology, would enjoy an elevated status under the Nazis, who came to power just as he was beginning his studies. Heinrich Himmler once said that National Socialism was, in the end, applied biology. And the very science that Mengele pursued enjoyed, in the words of one scholar, a symbiotic relationship with the Nazi state. You know, the science that he pursued, anthropology and, and, and medicine, and his interest in genetics, all of these received a um, special focus under the Nazis. They supplied the theoretical and ideological um, structure for uh, Nazi ideology, and they enjoyed a, an elevated status under the Nazis. And how does status express itself within the government context? Better funding, um, um, more status. And that, that's precisely what happened to the science that Mengele attached himself to. I explain how the role of the physician in Nazi Germany underwent a transformation where the so-called racial community, the Volksgemeinschaft, the German term, was substituted for the individual as the focus of a doctor's care. Nazi physicians could, in an intellectual and moral sleight of hand, remain faithful in their minds to their Hippocratic oaths and engage in Nazi racial and eugenic activities simply by substituting the perceived welfare of the race, of the people, or of, as the Germans say, of the folk, for that of the individual patient. I explain how Mengele was professionally engaged in so-called racial hygiene by delivering professional opinions about the race of individuals in criminal cases. Under the Nazis, a person could be accused of a criminal act if, if he, as a, as a Jew, had sexual relations with a non-Jew. And occasionally, these cases would come to court and the defense of the Jewish defendant would be, look, you may think I'm Jewish and my parents are Jewish, but I'm not a Jew because my mother had an affair with, with uh, her physician and who was a, an Aryan and not a Jew, and therefore I'm not a full Jew and I'm not then subject to the same sanctions um, if I had had sexual relations as a full Jew. And the court would in investigate this and they would call in someone like Mengele to do an evaluation of the individual. Is this a full Jew or is it a half Jew or is it a non-Jew? And Mengele would, would carry out these comprehensive um, examinations comparing character, racial characteristics, physical characteristics with that of the uh, parents and determine for the purpose of uh, reaching a, a um, decision in the court whether the person was a Jew or not. So Mengele employed his anthropological and medical knowledge in the service of the Nazi state by determining um, a kind of racial diagnosis. In the book, I also supply an important corrective to past biographies of Mengele by explaining his wartime experience as a frontline soldier with the SS Viking Division, which saw him exposed to combat and extreme violence from the very beginning of the invasion of the Soviet Union. 
until the retreat from Stalingrad 18 months later. Almost every single biography of Mengele um, makes a fundamental error in describing his military career and indicates that he was transferred out of this unit uh, much, much earlier than he actually was. In fact, Mengele experienced a kind of unrelenting combat and unrelenting violence um, from the beginning of the war with the Soviet Union until uh, January of 1943 when he was evacuated out of the retreating forces from, from Stalingrad. Uh, this is important because um, it could be argued that Mengele's exposure to uh, mass atrocities and to extreme violence had some impact on him uh, psychologically when, when he um, got to Auschwitz some months later. Um, and I think it's important to set the record straight about his experience. I devote an entire part of the book to Mengele's time at Auschwitz, although some of the citizen reviewers who have contributed opinions about my book to Amazon and Goodreads and other websites have faulted me for not focusing enough on this period in Mengele's life. I think that the section on Auschwitz that I have written makes a significant contribution. Now, I won't go into any detail now, but for anyone who thinks they know what Mengele was doing at Auschwitz, especially if they cannot read German and know little about recent scholarship on the subject, this book will surprise them, I think, in some fundamental ways. Mengele's main activity at Auschwitz and his main, um, I would say, the, 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 the largest crime that he was involved in, on, in, in manifold examples, was his ex his participation in the selections on the so-called ramp at Auschwitz. It was on the ramp where trains would unload their passengers, these people who had been forced into overcrowded, often cattle cars, and were torn from their homes with very little to take with them, who were confronted by the um, staff, guards, and physicians at Auschwitz. It was here that Mengele sorted out, Mengele and his colleagues sorted out those who arrived on the platform, making um, really a binary decision. Should someone be murdered immediately in the gas chambers at Auschwitz, or should they be allowed to survive a little bit longer so they could be exploited for their labor and for um, whatever service they could provide before being murdered? Um, once they got out of the train at Auschwitz, they were in essence already condemned, condemned to death, but Mengele and his colleagues would make this decision about those who were fit for, for labor and for exploitation and those who would be murdered immediately. Now, Mengele was not alone in this selection activity. Often people think that he was the only one on the ramp at Auschwitz. He was one of 15 to 20 physicians who were assigned to the camp and who were assigned this duty in a scheduled way, in a routine rotating way. Um, but it is not his activity on the ramp for which he is most notorious. It is really for his pursuit of his own science at Auschwitz. His, his, um, Search, searching for potential subjects of his experiments, and importantly also for his search for um, individuals who could assist him in the research that he was carrying out. When Mengele was on the ramp sorting out those who would die immediately and those who would be exploited first for the labor, he also asked for anyone who had any medical training to step forward. If you were a pharmacist, if you were a physician, if you were a anthropologist, if you were a medical technician, if you were a medical illustrator, if you were a nurse, he wanted to know it. And because at Auschwitz, Mengele decided that he would establish patterning on the medical research institute that he was associated with before the war, he would set up his own scientific research establishment at Auschwitz. And he had all of the necessary ingredients that, that were necessary. He had a huge number of potential subjects for experiments, unwilling and unwitting subjects, but he also had a tremendous pool of talented and experienced uh, 
um, medical personnel who could assist him in that. So Mengele has essentially established a medical institute, a research institute at Auschwitz, carrying out his research objectives. Uh, it's pretty clear that Mengele attempted at Auschwitz, uh, that his, one of his motives for doing this was that he wanted to advance his career, his scientific career. In Germany, if you want to have a position in a university or as the head of a research establishment, you, you have to do a kind of postdoctoral dissertation called a habilitation. And Mengele was clearly using his research at Auschwitz to advance his uh, ambition and to do research that would uh, eventually end up um, being the, the subject and, uh, of a, a habilitation schrift or a postdoctoral dissertation. Um, one of the problems with studying Mengele's science, so-called science at Auschwitz, is that there are very, very few records that document it. Very, very few. We have to rely on the testimony of witnesses, and those are inherently, in the context of medical experiments at Auschwitz, um, somewhat problematic, because the people who are testifying about what happened, although they can reasonably talk about what happened to them, their own experience as the subject of an experiment, it's very difficult for them to be able um, credibly to talk about what the purpose of the experiment was, what Mengele's objectives were. So it's very difficult to know precisely what he was trying to achieve at Auschwitz. We've been able through um, the work of some very, very uh, competent, quite brilliant German historians of science and others to reconstruct, and I do this in the book, I explain the five or six areas that Mengele was interested in and um, try to reconstruct what, what, he was, what he was about in terms of his scientific interest. Um, I think I might pause now just to, to kind of summarize my conclusions about Mengele at Auschwitz uh, by reading a, a brief uh, excerpt from the book. And it's interesting because when my son read the book, and I was very pleased that he did, he, he wrote me an email saying, Dad, I think this paragraph, and he noted on page 15, 115 of the book, really is the heart of your argument for the book. And I was pleased to note that he, I think he was right. And here it, here it goes. The notion of Mengele as unhinged, driven by demons, and indulging grotesque and sadistic impulses should be replaced by something perhaps even more unsettling. Mengele was, in fact, in the scientific vanguard, enjoying the confidence and mentorship of the leaders in his field. The science he pursued in Auschwitz, to the extent that we can reconstruct it, was not anomalous, but rather consistent with research carried out by others it was in what was considered to be the scientific establishment. That research was criminal and monstrous because of the absence of all barriers that ordinarily serve to contain and regulate the temptations and ambitions that can push science, scientific research, across ethical boundaries. Relegating Mengele and his research to the ranks of the anomalous and bizarre is perhaps more palatable than understanding that he was the product and promise of a much larger system of thought and practice. It is easier to dismiss an individual monster than to recognize the monstrous that can emerge from otherwise respected and enshrined institutions. So that's my the last word I'll, I'll, I'll say tonight on in, until the question and answer period on Mengele at Auschwitz. Let me just briefly describe what happened to Mengele after he left Auschwitz. It's an interesting story and it takes up a good part of the book because it's um, a story that I was responsible for trying to unravel and, and uh, and kind of decode in a sense. Uh, at the end of the war, Mengele, uh, you should know that Auschwitz was, was evacuated um, a week or two before, evacuated by the staff, the guard staff, uh, a week or two before the uh, Red Army, the Soviets, uh, liberated it in, on January 27th, 1945. Mengele left about a week before that, uh, packing up all of the research that he could fit in the several crates that he was able to pack. He and a colleague uh, drove out of Auschwitz and um, they decided um, that they would head to Berlin and to see whether uh, they could meet up with the chief physician for the SS and uh, find out what they should do. And Mengele, they got to Berlin and they 
the chief physician, uh, actually was outside of Berlin in, in Oranienburg, assigned Mengele to be the chief physician at another concentration camp called Gross Rosen, which is near Breslau in Germany. Mengele went there. Almost as soon as he got there, the camp was, uh, was threatened by the Red Army and, and soon liberated. Um, he went to a subcamp. Uh, by early May 1945, Mengele was on the road heading back toward Germany. And as he was heading back toward Germany, uh, around the, the, the city, the spa town of Karlsbad, he, he bumps into a, a German Wehrmacht, not an SS, but a Wehrmacht hospital unit. And lo and behold, one of the people who's assigned to that unit was a former colleague of his at the Institute in Frankfurt, where he had served before the war. And he asks this guy, his name was Kahler, uh, can I join with you? And Kahler asked the commanding officer and they allowed Mengele to join in with this unit. Mengele got rid of his SS uniform, which would, would have marked him immediately as someone worthy of investigation, uh, joined the medical unit, and by a stroke of luck for Mengele, this unit went north into the area south of Czechoslovakia in, in, uh, in what's called the Erzgebirge, and uh, he ended up in an area that was stuck between the advancing Red Army coming from the east and the advancing Western allies coming from the West in an area that even after the war ended on May 8th, 1945, was unoccupied by either the Western allies or the Soviets. So he was uh, able to establish himself with this hospital unit in this so-called no man's land, is what, what they called it, um, for about six weeks until mid-June when he and his colleagues decided it was time that they had to give themselves up. They couldn't stay in this no man's land forever. And they decided wisely that they would uh, find their way to um, go to the Americans and uh, give themselves up uh, to the Americans rather than the Soviets. A very wise choice because had they gone to the Soviets, they would have been um, at best uh, imprisoned for many, many, many years. And at worst, they, they may have uh, suffered a, a worse, but probably more justified fate. Um, they, they were taken into custody by the Americans uh, near, um, Nuremberg. Um, they were, Mengele and his colleagues were in two different American POW camps um, and eventually they were released um, because it was impossible for the allies, the Western allies, the Americans especially, to maintain these huge numbers of, um, of disarmed enemy combatants and prisoners of war at a time when they were responsible for occupying the country. They had to get the men, the former soldiers and current soldiers back into the fields to make sure that the harvest would be taken care of or else they'd have mass starvation that, that they would have to deal with. So they had, although earlier plans had been more measured in terms of when, how to investigate people and when to release them, um, they ended up with mass releases of prisoners. They did have a few safeguards that they employed to try to make sure they didn't release people who were really bad, bad guys. One of the things they did was to have all of the POWs before release take off their shirts and raise their arms. Now the SS, the Waffen SS, had underneath their left arm, they had their blood type tattooed into their, into their flesh so that if they were wounded and needed a transfusion and were unconscious, that the medic who, were, who was attending to them would know what blood type they were. The US Army puts the blood type on, on their dog tags, but the, the um, the Germans would put it on their, the SS would put it on their, on their, actually on their skin. Now Mengele didn't have this blood type tattoo. Uh, we know this from, from uh, interviewing his wife and from other sources that as the medical officer in his SS unit, he was responsible for, for initiating the, the tattooing process. And he was very vain about his appearance and didn't want to have that tattoo. And he did not have the tattoo. And we discovered in our research that although it was uh, a practice, it was by far not, not universal. And so Mengele was able to escape this one kind of um, effective litmus test, allegedly effective litmus test to determine whether he was in the SS and should be investigated further. Mengele's name was on POW, on, uh, excuse me, on wanted lists, but those wanted lists had not been, excuse me, had not been distributed effectively and had not reached the camps where he was released 
from which he was released in the summer of 1945. So um, Mengele was released and instead of going home, um, he decides to go underground and he gets a job as a farmhand in a farm uh, south of Munich near the city of uh, Regensburg. And he goes there, he's there for about five, four, about four years doing manual labor, very difficult manual labor um, for a very small uh, recompense. He's able to make contact with his family. His wife comes and visits him on a relatively routine basis. At some point after the Nuremberg trials and before the so-called doctor's trial in Nuremberg, um, he decides that he can't really make a life in Germany. And he's tired of the uh, exhausting work that he's been having to perform and he wants to have a new life and he decides that he wants to leave to leave Europe. So with the help of his wealthy family who have the biggest enterprise in, in his hometown, he's able to uh, finance uh, his escape from Europe. He makes his way through uh, Austria over through the Brenner Pass into Italy. He's able to get false papers uh, through the Red Cross and eventually get a get a visa to uh, Argentina and he makes his way from the port of Genoa in May of 1949 and arrives in Buenos Aires and there for about 10 years his life is relatively calm he's there under an assumed name he's quite nervous about revealing his identity he makes contact with the German emigrate community including Adolf Eichmann, whom he meets at least on three occasions. But he's still a bit wary. He had no reason to be afraid because he was in a benign environment. The, the head of Argentina at the time was Juan Perón, who was um, welcomed uh, Nazis into, into Argentina. Um, and I should say that he, when he goes to Argentina, his wife remains behind in Europe and his young son, Rolf. Uh, at some point, um, he, and it's a complicated story, which you have to read about, his, his father decides that, that he should um, marry his brother's widow. Mengele had two brothers. Uh, his, Mengele was the oldest of three sons, but his middle brother had died in 1949 of a heart attack, and his uh, wife was without um, family, had a, a son, but, but was, was single and lonely. And old man Mengele, the father of Joseph, decided that the that Martha and Joseph should get married. So Martha moves to uh, to Buenos Aires with her son Karl Heinz, and um, he, he, she and Mengele live for a few years before they get married. They get married in June, in July of 1958, in Uruguay, and almost exactly at that moment, the German judicial authorities begin to receive some indication that Mengele might be living in South America. And they begin carefully, gingerly, to uh, investigate that possibility. They're, they're pressured by, um, by certain groups um, and they make a fatal mistake. Uh, when they begin their investigation in the summer of 1958, they send investigators to Mengele's town, hometown, to ask about him, where he might be. Of course, a company town, there are no secrets from the boss, and Mengele's family learns of the judicial interest in Mengele, and they contact him right away. And he uh, decides that he has to go underground, that he's concerned about uh, the Germans seeking his arrest, and um, he decides to go to Paraguay. He goes to Paraguay in uh, the early fall of 1958, he sets up, establishes uh, some contacts there. He had visited there on business uh, earlier. And by within a year, he becomes a Paraguayan citizen. Um, and I think in May of 1959, he becomes a Paraguayan citizen uh, through fraud because he lies about how long he'd been there. And when, and he feels that he's safe. He, he is, uh, by the way, he's already reverted back to his name, uh, Mengele, he's known as Jose Mengele in, in Paraguay. But the Paraguayans have a law that say, if you're a naturalized citizen of Paraguay, you cannot be extradited to another country. 
So Mengele feels very safe. He knows that if the Germans really are able to meet the burden and, and overcome the, the political obstacles within Germany to, to uh, request his extradition, that the Paraguayans will not extradite him. It's not until May of 1960 when Adolf Eichmann is um, captured and spirited out of Argentina by the Israeli Secret Service that Mengele realizes that his perfect plan of refuge in Paraguay is worth nothing. Although the Paraguayans may not extradite him, there's nothing to prevent the Israelis from coming in and taking him. So he starts another emigration. This time he leaves behind the name Mengele and is uh, through the help of some right-wing circles um, is able to make his way to Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he is uh, protected by a number of different families. His own family delivers m funds to uh, allow him to live uh, a relatively modest life there, not the kind of life that we had imagined that he uh, would have lived, but he's safe, although always looking over his shoulder, always scanning the horizon for, for potential threats, never feeling comfortable. And he's there until, until February 1979, when um, he is on vacation on the coast of Brazil, a place called Bertioga, and he's swimming in the ocean, and he has a stroke, and he dies. And he's buried in the grave of under another man's name. No one reveals this fact to anyone. And, uh, and the story could really end there, except that in 1985, um, a group of survivors and of so-called Nazi hunters decide that it is intolerable that Mengele should be able to um, escape any kind of justice. And they begin to exert pressure on their respective governments to begin an investigation. And that's where, where I came in. Um, although Mengele was dead, no one knew it. And my office was involved with um, trying to determine uh, where Mengele was and to try to find him and to bring him to justice. My particular uh, assignment early on was to try to figure out, was Mengele somehow used by US institutions and personnel? Was he assisted in some way um, to get out of Europe? Was he protected? And uh, we carried out that investigation. And, uh, but soon that, soon our objective was not only that, but also to, to try to find him. And we joined with the Germans. Um, we worked with the, the state prosecutor in, in Frankfurt and with the Israelis who established an interagency uh, committee, which was essentially run by the Mossad, although the, the titular head was the justice ministry individual, but the Mossad really uh, were the, the motive force in, in the operation. And um, we met several times as a tripartite group of three countries, pooling resources, pooling knowledge, um, trying to figure out where Mengele was and, and, and how, to, how to get him. Uh, the US government, um, another part of the Justice Department got involved, the, the US Marshal Service, and they uh, created a rather elaborate plan of, of uh, stationing marshals in um, South America and establishing uh, a kind of agent or uh, informant network to try to find out where Mengele was. But in, in the end of May 1940, 1985, the Germans decided for a third time or a second time to search the home of a Mengele um, contact in, in the town of Gunzburg, Mengele's hometown. And there they, they discovered um, some correspondence which led them to believe that Mengele had gone to Brazil and that had died there. And so the, the scene shifted from, from, uh, from the search of the, apart, of the home in, in Germany to, to Sao Paulo. The Germans went down immediately. They forgot to tell us about this. We found out about it by watching CNN. We then followed the Germans down to, uh, to Sao Paulo. The Israeli sent representatives. And for two weeks, everyone um, kind of poured over the skeletal remains that had been exhumed from, from the grave, trying to decide, determine whether uh, 
the body was that of Joseph Mengele. There were a lot of people who believed that Mengele had both the motive, the means, and the opportunity to stage a, a hoax, to, to arrange for another body to, that had his similar characteristics uh, to be buried. And um, although the scientists originally agreed that Mengele, uh, that the body was Mengele's, um, the case was not closed. And I came back to the United States in the summer of 1985, and we began a very careful review of all the evidence. Um, and it took another three years, actually, until, um, until we were able, till I was able to satisfy myself that the body was Mengele's. And it took another three or four years beyond that until science caught up with the case um, and DNA was able to be employed. Thank you very much. Uh, I was sitting on the edge of my chair uh, okay. for what was going to be the next part of the story. And I've heard you speak before, so that just shows you. Uh, but it was a uh, terrific uh, explanation of this uh, episode in history. We do have a number of questions. I'll start with a very easy one. And that was how old was Mengele when he died? How old was he? He was 67. He was uh, uh, within the month of his 68th birthday. Okay. So he was younger than I am now. So there you go. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Um, this question is somewhat provocative. Do you think the capture of Eichmann in 60, 61 had any impact on the pursuit of Mengele, either to uh, make it more uh, pressing or perhaps to make it less urgent because now Israel had captured one major uh, Nazi figure, the pressure to capture another one might have been mitigated. Do you think it had either yeah. effect in either direction or no effect at all? Well, I, I spend a lot of time in the book talking about the efforts that the is Israelis undertook um, to find Mengele and in, in a larger perspective, the, the, the search for Nazi war criminals. And a, a lot of this was informed by something that uh, really I mentioned in my introduction that the, the um, Mossad declassified and published a report about their Mengele investigation in September of 2017. This was eye-opening for me uh, because uh, I, I was unaware of the extent to which they had gone to try to, to locate and capture Mengele. I knew a lot of the stories that had come out in kind of uh, mem memoir literature, but um, this was the real deal with, with documents behind it. And uh, the Israelis, um, after, you know, they had intended, Mengele was, was uh, kind of target number two in the mission to, to capture uh, Eichmann. And they had some intelligence on where Mengele was. They were wrong because Mengele was long gone from Buenos Aires at that time, but they had his former address. And once Eichmann was secure in the safe house, they, um, they sent out uh, uh, a couple of teams to try to determine where, where Mengele was. And, um, you know, they, they were able to surreptitiously talk to the, to the, a postal service person who was delivering mail to the, his former address and they they went to the the location of, of a, a business that he had started um, but of course he was long gone and they were unsuccessful but shortly thereafter they they engaged in a lot of different they, they followed up on a huge number of different allegations they recruited a, a Dutchman named Wilhelm, Wilhelm Sassen who had known Eichmann and they used him and they got very very close to getting Mengele in Brazil they were within you know, 20 meters of him, uh, almost almost certainly they had hit their eyes on him. It's not 100%, but I believe it to be the case. Um, and they didn't follow up in an appropriate way. And uh, because of German scientists being used by the Egyptians and their resources had to be pulled from, from that case. Uh, even later, they had very good intelligence about where he was and they failed to, to effectively follow up on it. Um, then there was a kind of hiatus um, beginning in 1967-68. Um, and there was this a tug and push and pull within the, within the Israeli Secret Service. Do you focus your energies on um, combating real and present danger? Or do you spend some of your resources going back to, to seek justice from from crimes of the past. And there was a big split, but, but those who believe that our limited resources should be used uh, 
to combat uh, our enemies today won out for about 10 years until Menachem Begin became um, became uh, prime minister. And they, um, not full full bore, but but they began again their search for Nazi war criminals and especially Mengele. So they, they had a real incentive to find him. Okay, um, here's a fairly long one, but I'll read it. What can you say about Rolf Mengele? How did Rolf feel about his father? From what I've read, the, the author of the question is saying, he was born a year before the end of the war and only met him as a teenager on a skiing holiday when he thought Mengele was his uncle. Later he came to him in Brazil after finding out who he was. Is that true? Why was Rolf never pers uh, uh, prosecuted for hiding him? He was a naturalized citizen. Yeah. So uh, you're right, questioner, about Rolf uh, with, with a couple of adjustments. Uh, he, he was born in, in on, on Mengele's own birthday, March 16, 1944. Um, Mengele saw him when he was an infant and saw him as a toddler when, when uh, his wife visited him uh, near the farm in, in Regensburg. But then when Mengele went to South America, the only other time he saw him and the first time he saw him as a kind of uh, cogent adult or, or teenager was when Mengele made a visit to uh, Switzerland and Germany in 1956 when he met his, his uh, sister-in-law and future wife. Um, and then Mengele's son does visit him in, in Brazil. And I spend, uh, the, the epilogue of the book is a description of this very, very interesting encounter between Mengele and his son, where the son, who was a kind of 68 er you know, long hair, progressive politics, uh, uh, born of that generation that, that kind of rejected and was suspicious of their parents, um, he goes to South America really loaded to confront his father about his father's past. Um, at the same time, he's, he's kind of um, restrained by, uh, uh, I, I met Rolf and he described it to me as this kind of intellectually knew what his father had done and, and believed it, but um, there was a, a biological connection, some kind of uh, difficult to explain connection. And the reason why he would, and, and that's why he didn't, he didn't give his father up, which he could have done. He could not have been prosecuted for that because under German law, um, you are not obligated to, to um, inform on, on uh, a close family member like that. And so, and he, it was inappropriate and uh, for the Germans to even question him about his father. Several people have asked what happened to Mengele's first wife. Yeah, she uh, she divorced him in 1954, um, and she remarried and raised her son. Uh, we back in the investigation, um, I never met her, but through a kind of ruse, um, one of my colleagues, who was a native German speaker, um, kind of befriended her telephonically, and uh, and I would be on the other extension. That's when we used to have extensions on the phones and I would kind of pass notes to my colleague who would then ask her questions and kind of interviewed her that way. Plus, um, um, we were able to get access to some of her, her diaries and other things through, um, through Rolf uh, and through a, 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 another a journalist who was involved in the case. So we were able to benefit from her knowledge without actually uh, interviewing her. Uh, this is a provocative question, but one I'm sure that you've thought about. To what extent do you, do you believe the knowledge gleaned from Nazi experiments should be used or ignored? Well, it's, it's, it's a classic question. And um, I, I should say, and I think it's this, this, one of the things that Mengele was involved in, and I was one of the research areas, there was a disease a kind of oral cancer known as NOMA, um, which had essentially disappeared in the developed world by, by the beginning, by the Second World War. It still exists now in, in places with, with bad uh, hygiene, bad, bad sanitary conditions, bad nutrition. But there was a big outbreak of this disease of NOMA. It, it's a kind of oral gangrene where the, the, the flesh is eaten away. It's quite a, a, a difficult one to, to imagine. And there was an outbreak of this in the so-called gypsy camp where Mengele was the uh, chief physician. 
And Mengele decided he wanted to find out how to cure this disease, how, how to treat it, find effective means to treat it. And he recruited an inmate physician named Berthold um, Epstein, who was a Czech physician, quite prominent pediatrician. And uh, Beckstein carried out his experiments and they were, they were able to find an effective treatment for this disease. Forgetting, of course, that the camp itself and the conditions were the cause of the disease. And if you improve the conditions, it would have improved the disease. But um, they were able to find a treatment using uh, certain kind of sulfur drugs and other stuff. Now, there were one of the inmate physicians who was, who was involved in this is a woman named Lucy Adelsberger, who was a Berlin, been in Berlin, a, 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 a quite successful physician. And she wrote a paper for the British journal Lancet in 1946, when she was, I think, maybe a, a still a displaced person, but she wrote about the treatment that was employed, giving the dosages and the, the uh, kinds of medicine. So in that sense, Mengele's research actually uh, was published and, and arguably could benefit um, the world. The question about, the, you know, the science, the, the answer I often give, to this question is that science by its very nature has to be repeatable. An experiment, if it's a legitimate experiment, has to be replicated by someone. Otherwise it can't be it can't be good science. And so if you if you have experiments that that uh, were done under conditions where there were unwilling participants and where there weren't safeguards and 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 um, then you can't consider that good science and you can't really rely on, on the findings, I think, or shouldn't. Okay, uh, back to a question about the wife. How much did the wife know about what Mengele was doing? Obviously, this is the first Yeah, one. so she, she visited him twice in Auschwitz, um, once in the summer of 1943, shortly after he arrived, and then again for an extended stay in the fall of 1944. And she writes in her diary, uh, we got access to uh, a transcript of relevant pages in the diary um, that her husband told, him, told her not to ask about what was going on there. She did indicate that, that their, their apartment, their home was cleaned by uh, prisoners. They were, I think they were Jehovah's Witnesses in, in striped uniforms. She talked about this kind of sweet odor in the air. She was clearly... Um, uh, aware of what was what was going on there, whether she knew the full extent, uh, I can't say. But there is a, a a scene that she describes in her diary where she, she had been taken ill with uh, with I think diphtheria and was put into the hospital at Auschwitz, and her husband Joseph would come every day and read to her. He, she read. He, she talks about him reading Balzac to her. Um, and in the book, I describe what he was doing before he came to visit her at the hospital and whom he encountered on the ramp and uh, um, as a kind of montage of the, of, the two, of the two characters, in a sense. Uh, was the second wife ever interviewed? You know, we were supposed to interview her. She lived, uh, she moved back from, when, when Mengele went, went to, to Brazil, she moved to Switzerland initially. And then, to the South Tyrol, to, to Murano. And my boss and I were, were scheduled to meet with her. We had an appointment, we were about to go see her. And uh, she called and said that her son, uh, Mengele's stepson slash nephew, had put the kibosh on it. So we weren't able to meet her. The Germans talked to her, of course, they, they interrogated her. And the Israelis, um, actually you know set up listening devices in her apartment um they provoked her in many ways to see if if she would reveal any information about about her husband okay two more questions i believe uh to what extent has the myth of mengala as a monster predetermined other more general histories of the nazi doctors whoa um I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, I mean, it, it raises an important issue, which I didn't mention, which is that, that of course, Mengele was not the only, was not the only uh, physician who carried out experiments. Uh, Mengele's experiments, by the way, were carried out not as part of his official duties at Auschwitz. They were done mainly on his own time. I mean, they were, they were sanctioned, but he didn't uh, get time off to do them. Whereas some uh, prisoner, some, some physicians at Auschwitz, 
uh, Carl Clauberg, for instance, who carried out a massive series of experiments for just de uh, determining an efficient way of mass sterilization, which was a kind of genocide, um, so that they could uh, sterilize uh, people en masse. And that was done at Auschwitz. There were people, there were experiments with uh, electroshock, uh, electroconvulsive uh, therapy. Um, there were experiments in, um, in uh, the, um, you know, drug experiments with the efficacy and dosage of how drugs should, should be administered. Um, Mengele was not alone, but he was perhaps a little bit unusual in that his science uh, was, uh, and I hate to use these terms, but it was really pure research science. It, it, it didn't have the kind of practical um, benefits that experiments in, you know, the, the famous experiments of the high pressure low pressure, high altitude experiments or the potability of seawater experiments, which arguably then had some kind of use for, for the Germans. This was really to add to, to scientific knowledge and to advance his career. Final question, what did you uncover in your research that surprised you, that you did not expect to find? Uh, was there one or two things that just jumped out at you and said, oh my God, I can't believe what I just read or saw? Well. Uh, when when I as I said earlier when I when I started writing this book it really was going to tell this for me fascinating kind of detective story of of you know first finding the the grave and then determining whether it was Mengele's it's it's quite an interesting story about about forensic medicine and that was really what I was going to do and then I started reading and I you know I had to write an introduction to that section of the book so I went uh, very deeply into the new scholarship. And um, I've already said that there aren't any records about Mengele's experiments, but there's a lot of stuff on the fringes that can be used to try to reconstruct and understand them. And it turns out that a lot of what I had found uh, in witness testimony, which didn't quite make sense to me, made much more sense when I understood the larger context. Um, and I remember talking to my wife at dinner uh, several nights in a row about the stuff I was finding about the actual um, so-called science behind behind his experiments. You know, I thought he was some off the rail, grotesque, um, without any kind of um, motivation that one could understand. And not that one can fully understand what he did, but there's, there's a, there is a, a rationale behind it which, as I've often said, uh, makes it in some ways more disturbing than if there weren't. For sure. Well, to wrap up, I would just offer this observation. Uh, the importance of Holocaust research uh, is really a very, very uh, critical aspect of our understanding of the Holocaust. The, having scholars such as Dr. David Marwell uh, generating this kind of new information and new knowledge is so important to our understanding of the Holocaust. There are so many other aspects that we haven't fully uncovered or studied, but this is an example of how history is actually created. Uh, a book like this, the amount of research that went into it and uh, putting it together. I wanna thank you very much on behalf of Holocaust Museum Houston. Uh, it's been a thrill to have you here uh, virtually. And I'm going to turn it back over to Tamara, who will wrap it up. Thank, Thank you, David. you both, David, for truly, this was a really fascinating and engaging discussion and all the questions that you answered. Uh, I think we probably could have spent another 10 minutes answering you answering questions. I just want to tell um, the audience also to remember that the book Mangala Unmasking the Angel of Death is available for purchase from the Brothers Bookstore as well as the museum's bookstore. And I also want to let you know that we have curbside pickup. So um, please go out and buy the book. Um, and again, thank you for attending. I want to be considerate of everybody's time. So I'll close this out. Thank you everyone for joining us on this webcast this evening and good night. <laughs>